Hey everybody, this is David P. France and I'm coming to you from Basel, Switzerland. Uh, before we get started, we want to make sure that you like, share, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, David P. France TV. Uh, today we are talking to another, I wouldn't say long loss, <laughs> but a, a, a friend of mine from way back, from way back from, from my from my high school days, from my junior, well, I didn't really know you in junior high, but I remember seeing you around in junior high. But this is Edward cool. Backford. Ed, we call him Eddie, but it's Edward Backford. He's uh, coming, it's actually in Los Angeles. He is the CEO, let me make sure I get this right, Black Eye Vision, uh, which is the product, it's a production, I mean, you can say, like a production company and you you really are actor producer director this is what you do this is what you we knew you as an actor in high school or in junior right. high um and i was just telling someone that i was recently interviewing that yeah it was just known that you were on tv right oh yeah ed does tv right or he's on tv but it wasn't like anybody i don't think people made a big deal about it because there were a lot of people doing that not not everybody was doing it but it was fairly common well, I, mean, I kind of kept it on the down low because I, it was when I was, I was a child actor. It was, I was right. nine years old when I did my first show. And, you know, coming to a new town and a new, and I, and I was, you know, remember with the North Boys Chorus and all that and traveling the world doing a music. You come to a new place, it's tough enough being a new guy. But then, oh, you know, oh, the guy on TV, this and that. You know, people Wait. F with you. You know what I mean? I, I didn't know about the Newark stuff. Like, the, like you were flying and, 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 and singing and stuff like this? Is that what you were doing before? Yeah, yeah. It was from, like, before I came to junior high school there, I was in uh, the North Boys Chorus School in Newark, in, New in Newark, New Jersey, for a couple of years. And at that point, they were still pretty renowned. And they were traveling, you know, to all over the world doing concerts. And we did a, co a show at Alice Tully Hall and Lincoln Center and all that kind of stuff. And uh, when I came to school, mm -hmm. you know, I was the new guy and you know, I want to be the guy that knows karate. So everybody runs up to you and wants to kick your butt. You know what I'm saying? Test so you when, out. When so did you time. start, when did you start middle school? Was it, was you? Um, well, I got to high school in 80, right? So. Okay. So I can't, I was there at 70. I moved there at 79, 1979. So, so maybe we were in junior high school. At the same right, time. right. We were there. We all, because what happened was the middle school changed the, the grades. We were the first um, ninth grade in high school. Exactly. We, we exactly. Wow. Is this, is this, are we allowed to curse on this? Or should I you can if you want, but I, I would say this. Um, I, I didn't know all of that stuff about you. I mean, this is, I mean, I'm glad that uh, we, we are having a conversation because then it makes total sense. Like you really are, you know, like a showbiz kid, like you are an arts through and through, right? So when we have the conversation about how you got to Washington, and started doing that in Atlanta. I, I don't know if you see it as a as a as a detour, but you now are in Los Angeles doing what it is that you have been doing yeah. for a long time. I, I'm back again. It's like life throws you detours. You know, I, I it was like put it this way: you're 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 black, so black I'm families. Black. <laughs> you're black. So black families nurture your creative side. And, and, you know, my mom and, and, and my grandmother and everybody, they all nurtured and the, the music and the uh -huh. acting and the theater and all that until it's time to go to school. Then it's like, right. okay, that's a hobby. <laughs> what are you going to do? Because, you know, all the men in my family, all the women are accomplished pianists and entrepreneurs. Uh -huh. All the men in my family are like doctors and lawyers. But they were all artistic. But uh -huh. back in the day, black folks didn't roll the dice on that. That was a hobby. That made you a rounded individual. Uh -huh. But now it's time to go to school, get serious. That's why I told you I wanted to go to NYU and study film and, 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 and acting. And, and they were like, yeah, no, you're going to Morehouse. You've got a biology scholarship. So pretty bad it is. So, yeah. you know, historically black college and pursue the medicine side, the, the, the books. So what, you know? I mean, what was that experience like going from, I mean, we, we would consider our school, our high school, our junior high school experience. It was um, majority white, right? Yeah. Um, I would say heavy Jewish, Italian, Irish immigration, uh, immigration, immigrant, like second or third generation, second or yeah. third generation. So that, yeah. 
we were you know, from oh, that yeah. to Morehouse. What was that? What yeah, was and that was, that was funny. That was a, a big question even leading up to it was, you know, the family was like, are you going to be able to adapt to being around all black people from being around all growing up? Because even before high school, I was in Montclair Kimberly Academy. That was private, you know, mm -hmm. uniforms and private all white school. I, I was probably even more in the minority then. So that was from second grade up to, you know, when I left, uh -huh. North Boys Chorus was the first, and that was private academy. Uh -huh. first, and then after that, then boom, public school system, South Orange Junior High, <laughs> Columbia High School. So it was like the uncoiled spring, like from like a total private, you know, upbringing uh, to, yeah, the, the public school in Columbia. Then right. to Morehouse, that, that was a big question. Well, will you be able to adapt? Will you be able to? I mean, I, people are people in my mind. We weren't raised with that kind of, I mean, it was there, but you had asked me a question leading up to this the other day when we were talking about this interview. You were like, when did you first start noticing things? Like at the time it was happening to you or later looking back? But you in know, general, we, right. There was race around us and things right. like that around us all the time. But I mean, we interacted, you know, with people that, you know, I mean, it was there, but it really wasn't, it wasn't a thing until later in life when, you mm -hmm. know, I had to look back and say, oh, yeah, you know what? I did encounter some stuff. <laughs> now that you mention it. Well, the, the difference, Ed, was for me, my, you know, I was coming from Baltimore, and I came up in a majority, not a majority, it was an integrated school, but there were enough Black, and my family was there, right? So once we moved to South Orange, or to New Jersey, that was like, oh, my God, it was a completely... Uh, different vibe, everything, yeah. right? I mean, it, it was different. And just so you guys know, I mean, it's because these pe people from all around the world are going to be watching the video. In the United States, when we were coming up, and this is the late 70s, early 80s, there still was, and, and you're just seeing it play out even now in 2020, uh, there was segregation. It was post, you know, legal segregation, but there still was segregation self-segregation or you know active segregation and in the south orange maplewood school system i which is a I, pretty good school system by the it way. was it, it was an excellent school system and it was one of the places where the experiment of integration was taking place would you say because you know, going from that school system and going elsewhere in, in, the, in, in the country, you saw the difference, right, in terms of that enclave versus everywhere else. So we had a lot of practice, I think, uh, in dealing with all kinds of people. And also because we were involved in the arts, um, that also helped, would you say? I mean, yeah. you're already, you know, you're, you're operating in a world that is not necessarily predominantly black if you're going into New York for auditions or you're going into TV and, and so on. Same thing for dance. You know, um, that being said. It, it, was, it was progressive and it was open, you know, uh, it was definitely there, but even back then, it's just like up until recently before, you know, the darkness that we're living in now with the, anyway, mm -hmm. it was sort of like on the, it, it, it was behind your back. It was like, right. is he around? The things were, it was there it just wasn't so blatantly open like mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and i remember a friend of mine murph who was a few years ahead of us even but in the same school system reminded me about a time that we went so he lived in maplewood i lived in south orange the borderline mm -hmm. was like a couple blocks away right both affluent you know neighborhoods right and uh so he, he took me to the uh what was that the maplewood country club to play tennis one day and they wouldn't let me in they wouldn't right. let us in Yes, sure. And I don't, I, he had to remind me of this. He was just like, they told him, you know, unless you're a member or a caddy. Right, sure. And, and even, even I said, even none of the young boys making the money there caddying were, black, were, were all white kids. Right. And I was like, oh, yeah, I do kind of vaguely remember that. And he's, he was surprised that I barely remember that because to him it was a huge deal. He, of yeah. course, he came over from England. He was from England. All right, sure. So he was like, it was to him, it was a prevalent memory and a big deal at the time. And he was outraged. He told his family about it. And I didn't even remember it until he told me about it a few years back. 
I was like, oh yeah, I do kind of remember that. And he was like, well, yeah, take it. Yeah. I don't know. It was weird. It was. Well, he's just so used to it. You're so used to it that you're not even, and, and like most things, right? <laughs> but look, tell people what you're doing now, and then we're going to backtrack, right? So tell folks why you're in L.A., what you've been up to, because I think this is fascinating. We talked briefly about it uh, a couple days ago. Um, Ed, Ed, Edward, Edward works as a, an assistant all director. three, Eddie, Ed, Edward. <laughs> that was a first. That was good. <laughs> Just call me whatever. Working as, a, as an assistant director in Los just Angeles. Call me whatever comes out of your mouth. It's fine. What is what? what you tell folks what you're up to. What is what is an AD? Because I've heard the term, you know, and, and well, I've, I've seen AD, it on the credits. AD is an assistant director. There's several levels of AD, um, and I'll explain to you how I got to the AD position. But the first AD is what I am. I'm in the union. I'm in the Directors Guild of America as a. Uh, 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 first assistant director. The assistant director is the right hand to the director. So on the left hand, or let's say the right hand is the, the DP, the, the cinematographer or director of photography. The left mm -hmm. hand is the AD. And basically, my job is to keep the world away from the director so that he can work with the talent and work with his cinematographer to create beautiful pictures and nice and, and, and amazing scenes without having to worry about lights falling on your head or making the day or running out of light or lunchtime or trucks that don't arrive or actors that are disgruntled or anything. So basically we wear an earpiece in the world. I've got two, two assistants, a second assistant director and a second, second assistant director. In England and London over there, they call them the third assistant director, but their jobs are to my two assistants. The second AD lives in tomorrow so I can run today. And, and make the day. We have 12 mm -hmm. hours of sunlight. You have to shoot a certain amount of scenes. You have to handle countless background and crew and cast. Everybody has to work in sync and you have to make the days so that you can make the budget so that studios will pay for everything. And you have to do it safe because with all those moving parts, things can tend to get a little crazy, especially when you're dealing with stunts and you're dealing with vehicles and you're dealing mm -hmm. with animals and you name it, you know shit can go wrong and 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 it's my job specifically as the first assistant director to create the schedule that's doable make the day and make it safe mm -hmm. and keep the world away from the director so he doesn't or she doesn't have to worry about all the minutia that it takes to to do that the second assistant director is living in tomorrow so it's all set up when we get there we're not doing it on the fly mm -hmm. and all the paperwork you know to make sure that everybody's all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed on the day. And the second second, or the third director, runs between the two of us, getting the talent and everybody prepped and keeping them happy and comfortable until it's time to bring them to the set to me to work and then bring them back. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what I do. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an assistant director, first assistant director. Um, it's taken me eight years to get into the union just to do that. And I've got in probably a little faster than most. Um, I got on the path because when I was back East coming up, I was acting mostly with the desire to direct. And I came a point when it was time to apply to schools and I wanted to go to New York. I applied to like places like Carnegie Mellon and Yale for theater and NYU for film and perform and acting and stuff like that. And, um, it was super, even back then in the, in the 80s, right? to get into Tisch School of Film, it was, I think, like $28,000, $30,000 a year back then. And it was one of the more expensive schools, cool. you know, to get into. And they were, there was, it was in such demand that they were turning away more people from that program than they were from the medical program. I remember. So it was really tough. And so I got into a bunch of the programs, but lo and behold, <laughs> I couldn't afford to do it. Right. And no. so that was another reason why the family was like, well, you know what, it's, time for you to get serious and you know pursue something and you can do your little acting thing as a hobby. Like you did. So I went away to school to Morehouse and I did. I took my little partial scholarship in biology with the intent of a pre-med and I tried to dabble in the theater along the way and realized that you know it, when your heart's not fully into something you know I, I come from a family that's uh, full of excellence and, and, and love and support um, bees in their mind are failing. 
you know, it's, especially when you're black, they say you have to work twice as hard as uh, your counterparts to be considered just as good. And so to, to work, and, and Morehouse, by the way, is, is, is considered like, they don't like saying this anymore, but look, Black Harvard, it, it's one of the top schools, uh, historically black colleges in, in the country, and uh, along with Howard University and, and places like that. And uh, there, to come in with like a high grade point average and, and straight A's or whatever, was the average student. Right, sure. So right here. To go from being really good where you come from home to in a pool, a deep pool of people of excellence, to be pulling B's is considered not, you know, I mean, it's, you don't want to be a B, you want a B doctor operating on you, right? <laughs> right? So, right, right, right. Oh, so after a while, I made the decision to leave. I mean, I was helped by the fact that I was in a pretty bad car accident and I had to, you know, I was severely injured and I had to come home. Uh, what, 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 what year? What, what, what year? I'm sorry. What, what, what year was that? Was that the second oh, year? Third? 85. Yeah. Going, yeah. Second year. I don't uh, remember. I remember. And, um, yeah. So I'm, I, I, while I was home rec recovering and recuperating, you know, at, at, the other thing too was it, it's the college the schools, they, they treated you like the, the adult that you were supposed to be. They didn't call home and send your grades home to your family. So they, you know, you didn't get a report card. That was their job. They, you were an adult. So the family didn't really know that I wasn't, that I was pulling, you know, I was pulling, I'd say for my first year, there was no extracurriculars. There was no, uh, you don't, you didn't take your bottom level classes and then save all your prerequisites. You had to declare early there. And so mm -hmm. your first year, I was taking classes like vertebrae embryology and oh, German and cal calculus mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And it was, I was, I'd say I was in the library more than I was in my dorm room. You know, mm -hmm. and just squeaking by with a B average, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and to me, that was failing. And I didn't want to do that. So um, I slacked off. And I got on probation. And I got into a car accident. And I had to go home and recover. And, uh, and, a, and a long recovery, months of recovery. It was a pretty bad, I, I broke my hip, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty bad accident. I had a lot of time to think about what I was going to be faced with to go back and try and measure up again. And I made a decision, you know what, I'm going to not do that. I'm going to go on and I'm going to, I'm going to study acting in theater. And my family was like, oh, okay, well, we understand, you know, biology pre-meds not for everybody. You know, not everybody's cut out for that. They just assumed that I flunked out. Mm -hmm. you know, that I didn't, you know. And then they got a hold of the, uh, the, the average, ish grades and we're like well, wait a minute you were doing it you were you know you, it was happening you're like well, you're just giving up i'm like well no you know i'm not giving up i just they're like wow that's that's a man's decision you know and men don't live at home with their mommies yeah sure, so, sure, sure. you know time to move on so i did I, I i applied for school in new york uh it was a long process the american music american musical and dramatic academy I looked at AADA and, and AMDA. And, what, uh, is that? what is that? What is that? What is that? What is that? AADA. AADA was the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, which was uh -huh. like more of a formal two to four year program. Right. For study performing. AMDA was like, it could be a two year or a three year, but the three year extension, uh, like work, you know, you could go to Europe and do a year or whatever. And it was mm -hmm. two years. So more of a, it was, it was a, I don't know if it's technically accredited, but you didn't technically get a diploma of sorts. But you know, you it, it was a deep dive into like you know if you if you Google them, look up. I mean, there's so a you lot. So you did of, you did that you program. Know, there's a which, lot of which, people. That, uh, Amer AMDA, American Music and Dramatic. Okay, okay, and that's in New York. That's in New York. So I went and I applied, and the family was basically like. Yeah, you know, we're not really down with paying for you to go learn just how to entertain people. You know, I mean, like that's something you you got to figure out on your own. Uh huh. So while I was waiting a year, I enrolled in the Rutgers because you know that was right down the street for sure. Me, with the intent of not, I did some theater work at the you know uh, down at the Mason Grove School of the Arts, and I got involved with the ensemble theater company and, mm. and did some theater and plays and 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 went to school at night. 
and, and like New Jersey winter nights in Newark and, and New Brunswick, driving back and forth and then getting up and being uh -huh. carpentry during the day to pay the bills. It was, it was a grind. It was tough. And uh, I think at one, one point, I think I was even living in my car because uh -huh. I didn't want to go crawling back home. Right, I get it. I would pull up behind Our Lady of Sorrows. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed safe. And I would crash and I'd get up and I'd go do my thing. And, then, <laughs> and lo and behold, I got into Amber. Uh -huh. I was just as surprised. Uh -huh. I went over to New York. I, I, uh, I got a little place back in Montclair. I would take the decamp bus across to New York every morning, every day. And uh, work on the weekends. You weren't supposed to work. You're supposed to be intensive. Of course. It was it was performing, dude. It was dance. It was uh -huh. speech. It was theater performance. It was tap. It was ballet. It was all this acting theater. It was it was intense, and I, I really dug it. And there, there were a lot of super creative people there, but it was hard. It was really difficult. And um, and. Uh, while trying to juggle that back and forth from New Jersey and work and whatever, I started. I got into the one of the elite levels of the class. But I mean, you you were there. You 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 and I danced. I danced briefly together with you because we were on the. Yeah, he was in, he was he was in he was in, in the dance class in the dance uh, program right, at, at, in high school. We were on the gymnastics team. Too. Dave was That's captain right. of our gymnastics team, and I was a lower rung gymnast, but. Uh, uh, our <laughs> coach Spidell, right? It was Spidell. Yes. And yes. He felt that it was it was good for all of us athletes to go take a dance class to learn timing and and, and how to mm -hmm. you know. So we, some of us did anyway. Went and took me, Johnny Ray, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying to me, you're telling me that Spidell recommended that? What else? Hell else would I join dance class? I, I now I get it. Okay. Okay. Even then, I was like six foot. Uh huh. Three, uh -huh. Big uh -huh. In his uh -huh. rail, I, I was goofy looking, man. And it was, okay. I was not graceful. And by the way, that translated to New York. It could try to make six foot three and a half, 130, 40 pounds look graceful in ballet class. Oh, man. Ballet was one of my favorite classes, but it was hard. Uh -huh. So 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 you took all these classes with this particular program, and um, how long is the program? Is it is it like a it nine month year. program? No, it was two yeah. years. And uh, oh, it was two years. First year or so ish, I got an evaluation that said that you know I wasn't measuring up with the elite oh. class that I was in, and it was mostly because I wasn't staying in the dorms there. I would crash with my friends in their dorms, the, the Ansonia building. It was right there, right above the Beacon Theater, like 73rd right. and Broadway. Uh -huh, right uh -huh. But then I would get on the bus and go back to Jersey and crash, and I'd work on the weekends doing carpentry, and I would get up, and I would study, and I'd get on the bus, and I'd go back. And it, it, I was just, it, I, I didn't measure up. So they took, told me to take a break and come back. And uh, I did. I took a break, and I, you know, I don't remember what I did probably got high, but who knows. <laughs> I, I didn't, I went back and I, I don't, I technically, I didn't finish, I didn't finish there. Um, and somehow I think from New York, I ended up. In Washington? No. Let's see, what was I? Oh, we had the bands. So we did the band for a while. We formed, we were, I, oh, it's another thing we were doing at the same time. We formed that band, Suburban Beat, me, Lamont, and Carl. Oh, geez. You don't remember the band? Okay, no, I don't remember. But, but I, I, look, I knew you guys were active, though. That's for sure. Oh, yeah, I mean, we were, we were, we you, were doing you had a band, and, and, and we were, were you forward. getting gigs? You get, because Lamont, also, oh, so now it's coming back. Lamont was the singer, right? Mm -hmm. Lamont could sing. That was, his claim, that was his claim, the, not claim the fame, but that's what he was known for yes, in high school, his acting and his, and his singing. Well, I was a huge rock of talent. Our band's name was Suburban B. Well, uh -huh. it's spelled B-E-I with a little hyphen on top T. And the reason uh -huh. why it was not Suburban Bite like that weird was because it was in the 80s, 90s, New Wave era. And uh, when we were recording with the band, and, and I built a studio in a house in Montclair, and we would that, we were doing this full time. We were full tilt and recording. And L was like the master at pulling up hairs. You know what I mean? Like you, we could go out drinking, hanging out, or whatever, and somehow L would have three, four pairs back at the house 
Mm -hmm. you know, au pairs were uh, foreign babysitters mm -hmm. from like Europe and all over the world. Come so they, to the they, 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 we were able to figure out who the au, pair, the au pairs were. And, uh... Well, they, L was, you know, L was L, you know. I was no slouch, but L was L, you know. And uh, Carl was the dark, mysterious one that loved reggae and played the bass. And women mm -hmm. love bass players. Anyway, <laughs> we would, uh, they would, they would come back to the house and we would play some music and, and uh, I forgot the point I was going to make about this. Oh yeah. Well, so the, they, the idea is that you were doing, you were doing band, you're doing all this other stuff, right? Or a, a lot, lot of different things. couldn't pronounce beat. They couldn't say, because they were from Europe, different countries, they would say, bite, so I've been bite. And so that's why we named the band that. And then uh, we would uh -huh. all, and every time we would have a rehearsal, there'd be a house full of fucking chicks. I mean, all the time. And uh, and all of our, this is how long ago it was. Only I still have all of our, our like rehearsal tapes. I've been d digitizing them. And on all the tracks, all you hear is girls in the background talking. So we got to the point where we would just leave them on the tracks, like introing the songs. Right, sure. And, uh, it was it was a good time. It was a fun time, but it had to end, of course. With you know, we almost got a record contract, and that, that ratcheted things up. And with the pressure of that, let's just say it, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. We tried a few different incarnations of the band with different people, and you know, and then it became time to move on. And when I moved on, that's when I, I went to uh, DC. Uh huh. Uh huh. And in DC, this is when the early '90s, you would say, right? Yeah, like 90, 91, 90, 91. 92, 91, yeah. 92. Yeah, and I ended up in D.C. And uh, I went down there because I had a cousin there who was at Howard University. And uh, he was, he said, you know, come on down here, change the scenery. You know, and I was still very being in the creative and stuff like that. And I came down there and he and I formed a, a small production company called Runaway Entertainment. And we did music shot music videos we used howard's equipment and, and, and students and staff and we got all, we won some awards and stuff like that for videos and um while i was down there i i met my what what would turn out to be my wife and we got married and we bought a house in maryland and we moved to maryland and we had a, a, a at the time you know i was day job whenever you're an actor musician you always have to have another job sure so that was, I started off in audio because that was, you know, from the music and all that is where it's what I knew. But I eventually segued into camera operating and studio work and I ended up working, uh, meeting a guy named Larry, whose dad owned uh, the Washington News Network down there. I mean, they were mm -hmm. basically stringers for a lot of major networks in the area. Right. And that's what I did. I was a news photographer for about 12 years. I covered all eight years of the Clinton White House and, and Capitol Hill. And I covered four years of Baby Bush White House. And that four years was enough to, I was so disillusioned, you know, well, after well, teaching well, and all that. When I met you, like, because I think at the time you, you, you told me uh, in a previous conversation that you, that we, we ran into each other uh, in Washington in the early right. 90s, right? So that when was you- that, that was that time period, yeah. But probably, so you, I remember you were working I think you were actually working at that point as a photographer, right? Working yeah, in the White yeah. House. Well, I was a cameraman. You know, I was the guy you see on the street with the camera and uh -huh. shooting interviews. Right. And um, yeah, we, I met my ex, my now ex-wife, but at the time I met her. Um, and I moved, I was actually engaged to another woman, a uh, lovely Panamanian woman. And but we didn't make it. I was supposed to join the. I, I, I let's just say I enlisted in the Air Force, and let's just say that didn't go well. <laughs> so, so 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 let me let me let me let me let me uh, put this out here. Yeah, so yeah. it seems as if now because I'm starting to see a a, a thread or a pattern, yeah. which was like you're doing everything but the thing <laughs> that right. you really you know knew how to do and, and were involved in at a very early age. Is it safe to say or safe to? No, because all along I was still auditioning and taking acting gigs. Uh -huh, but just okay. as you get older and you grow up, as they say, it becomes less and less about only following your passion, the, 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 the privilege that you have of doing that, but you have to eat. To yeah, sure, 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 sure. There was always jobs. You know, in my industry, in, in the, the acting world and music world, it's usually 
you're a waiter or a bartender. And believe me, I did that too for a long time. Um, even there in DC. And um, I skipped over that because, you know, it was less important than, you know, uh, while I was dating my soon to become wife, I was a waiter and a bartender. And then from there I met Larry and from Larry I did audio because I knew sound from the music and from sound I did editing. And, and then from editing, you got to do the camera work. And after you do the camera work, that's the more lucrative job. So you do more of that. And then you end up doing stand-ups and back then during impeachment and Clinton era, if you're doing live shots and stand-ups all the time, you're making a lot of money. I made enough money just off of Monica Gate and, 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 and Clinton's impeachment hearings uh, doing uh, stand, uh, camera work that I was able to buy a house. We had a, some friends of our, there, there was, <laughs> we all, a group of us had a farm out in Virginia that we co-opted and uh -huh. boat sailing and all. I mean, we, you know, you build life. And then the next thing you know, you're, 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 you're doing that a little bit more than you're doing your creative. Right, sure, 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 sure. And then, uh, but that came to a head too, uh, when I realized, you know, that went for, I ended up, in the, we lasted for a good, I think we were together for almost 13 years, married better than uh, Yeah, that's a, that's a substantial amount of time. Yeah, it was good. I mean, it, was, it was great. And we're still friends to this day, you know. Um, but, you know, then from there, I went, I went back to Jersey briefly sort of like get my head straight from being divorced that to me that was the single biggest failure of my life you know was you know nothing else seemed like and to this day it doesn't seem like failure to me until you stop and if, it's like if you get knocked down as long as you keep getting back up right you no know, it's not failure that's just that's you learn a lot more from those than you do from the success so, so why on the, why the marriage uh why doesn't the marriage have the same sort of okay you just get up and keep moving I'm well, asking eventually, just, eventually yeah. you do. And, you know, the, the, the easiest answer was because, you know, we were in love. You know, nothing, yeah. nothing hurts like lost love, right? I mean, you lose a job, they say, for men, that's pretty bad. But you get another job, I guess you could get another wife, too. But, you know, even when we, you know, divorced, I still loved my wife, you know. Uh -huh. And that, that kind of thing. Just so, but I, it, it took, you know, after... 10 years, a big part of it too was one of, one of the issues we had was that seemingly we wanted to have kids and it just never gelled, never came together. And then toward the end there, it, it was made clear that it wasn't going to be a thing. You know, it wasn't going to happen for us. And so it's hard to recover from that. And so uh, I uh, came back to Jersey. And luckily, you know, I had my aunt Joan and my mom had my back and they convinced me to go move to the, to the beach house. Ah, okay. Beach, the beach house in Belmar, New Jersey. Right, oceanfront. And, and, and ocean front. tell you, if you ever got to lick your wounds <laughs> and mm. figure out life, sitting on the veranda of a house that looks out over the ocean it is the best place to do it. Mm -hmm. And another byproduct of that is, if you happen to have a beachfront property, <laughs> you get a lot of friends fast. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Cool. So that that'll liken itself to the quickest way to get over somebody is to get under somebody else right uh -huh. a lot of that i spent about two years of uh -huh. surfing <laughs> <laughs> and um getting under somebody else uh-huh uh -huh. and then it so so, so ed when you're doing all this stuff, I mean, you 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 oh, and constantly writing the whole time. I, constantly I'm writing. Writing. I mean, for for the average person that you know has the job and this sort of thing. I mean, they would be unnerved. I'm I'm just guessing. They would be unnerved by all of the different things that you were doing. Like in other words, was your wife bothered or unnerved because there yes. did not seem to be something that a a married wife would want to 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 endure. From well, I mean, yes and no. I mean, think about it. It's like our our courtship was over two years long. Okay. You know, so she very much knew who I was, you know, um, and the I was a very passionate person, you know. My it wasn't just a fleeting. It wasn't a hobby to me. I mean, I, and I, by the way, I was pretty good at it. I was actually 
paying bills, making a living, able to buy a home, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yes, it did get to a point where the, 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 it was like, okay, well, you know, now we need to like settle down and, you know, forget about the freelancing and the, the, the right. infrequent paychecks and stuff. We need some stability. Right. And she and I went and did some counseling and we, we, we got together on the same page and we decided to take a trip together. We, she was, she was, um, she traveled some, somewhat for her work at the time. So we turned one of her trips to Puerto Rico into a retreat to, to, to talk to each other and figure out what we needed. And we created lists that we gave to each other as gifts of what we each needed from the other one in order to go forward. And, um, one of hers major ones was the financial stability, sure. which was, uh, sure. so I think probably within two weeks of returning from that trip, I had completely put down the freelancing and the acting. And, um, I, that's how I got into the news business. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how I started. You know, mm -hmm. I, I got, I ended up with an $80,000 a year. And back then that was a pretty good job on K street in DC working master control in, in a, in a television, uh, yeah, that's pretty good. Light uplink company. Yeah, that's pretty good. And it was very lucrative, and it was it, it had all. It, we were able to pay down all the debt and get the right amount of savings you're supposed to have for you know emergency funds for the house. Right. For sure. You got kids. You should have several months of pay banked. And we did. We did all of that. It all happened, and uh, it drove me fucking nuts. I I started losing it. It's like, I, it's just like I completely changed who I was into something else. And I became this guy that was not the guy that she knew or married. So whereas it's like, be careful what you wish for thing, because that ultimately drove us apart. She's like, I don't know who you are. And I was like, well, I don't know who the fuck I am either. You know, and not only that was I, I just getting up and going to a, a, a job and punching a clock, having not been that guy for most of my life. It was, don't get me wrong, it was great banking the checks and, and having financial stability, but I just numbed out. Mm. And, and I, I tried to talk to her about it and we talked about it and we couldn't come together on it. On uh, So we moved, we moved on. That's in a nutshell, you know, it did, we tried, we fought, we fought the good fight. I'll give her credit for that too. I mean, but it just, I couldn't sustain on that level. I, I, there was like no creative in my world anymore and, and, and have it pent up. And then when you, when you, when you squash it down like that for money, uh -huh. you get blocked, you know what I mean? And I got blocked and uh -huh. get unblocked. I got inebriated and uh -huh. I got inebriated. She got disillusioned and, you know what I mean? It's life, you know? And so it's, I moved on. I moved up to Jersey. I, I played a lot. Carl and I, we traveled a lot. Costa Rica, Puerto Rico, all different kinds of places. Hanging. Sort of thing, chasing hanging rain. out. Yes. Yeah. And so <laughs> came back and uh, took a big hard look one day at my bank account. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. Oof. It's time for me to really start getting... <laughs> And so I was, one of the things that I did right during that time period was while sitting out there staring out at the ocean, waiting for the answers to come floating in across the waves, one thing I did figure out was how I best and wanted to spend my days of my, and when I say, I'm talking about literally, I broke it down to a one month, six month, one year year, three year, five year, 10 year plans that I, that I wanted. I started to understand, and that, even down to the day, how I like to spend my day. Like I, I, I wasn't a coffee drinker, but when I wake up in the morning with the sounds of the waves, the first thing I would do was get up, go out into the water and take my board or just jump in and swim, come back, take a shower, check my emails, make my calls, put things in place. And by like noon, one, two in the afternoon, I was, I was clear. And then I call the buddy and we'd go out and we'd happy hour and shoot pool. And, and it was just over time, it became like, a, it was clear that this is how I want to spend my life. And so I, I designed my future that way. And I thought about it. Well, I'm not married. I've got no kids. Um, I was 39 years old. I 
didn't have any debt, no student loans, no car payment. That's amazing. That's amazing. I was like, if I don't go to LA, if, if I can't say I, uh, this is acting and directing is what I want to do. Uh, if not now, when am I going to do it? Right. I mean, if not now, I mean, because a year from now, I might have a kid. I might have a, you know what I mean? So I had no more excuses. So I, I, I left. I came. I came not move to LA. At 39, at 39, you moved to, to Los Angeles. 39, 40, I think that was when I landed here. November. Yeah, well, look, look, look. Hey, I moved to Switzerland. I think it was, I think I was 39. I think yeah. I was 39. Now, something similar, like um, I, I would put it this way. Um, I always liked being in business or the, the idea of business. And I always, of course, you know, I, I'm a creative person. So I would try to find the middle. But when I decided to come here, it was solely to get stable. Because, you know, Switzerland is a very <laughs> stable country. <laughs> you laugh. I don't know. If you... I'm laughing because it is very, you know, they are very, you know, you would, you would laugh because you'd be like, but in other words, I hear what you're saying, like 100%. You know, and to do that at 20, at 39, that's a big, that's a huge deal. I landed here on, um, now I had a buddy from D.C. who I'd come up with, uh -huh. who wasn't even in the business. He was an activist. He was a, like a, an anti-death uh, penalty activist and, you know, children's rights and all that kind of stuff. And he came out here to do that and ended up in the business. Uh -huh. uh, in, o in order for me to get out here, I had to figure out, okay, well, I couldn't afford film school. I wanted to be a segue from... I can always act, but segue to the directing chair because it seems like what I, I was good at. You know, I had done videos and things, other things I hadn't talked about. All along, all that writing, I was also sh always shooting things of my own, two little small right. projects, things like that. Right. Um, but I just couldn't afford school, so I was like, okay, let me get on the internet here and figure out what's the best job out in LA that I'm going to get that's going to keep me on set so I could observe the director, observe the DP, and be around the actors. So I can basically train myself in, in, in you know, that would be my film school, work study, basically. Yeah, and yeah. I came up with First AD. First AD was spot on. Now, little did I know that it is one of the most difficult jobs there is in Hollywood and on set because of the, uh, it's like the foreman, you know? It's like you, you have to schedule Everybody on the set has one job. The AD has to do a little bit of everybody's job to keep yep. everybody working in sync and safe and on time. And when you have to tell people no a lot, you know, I like to think that my job is to create an environment where everybody can do their best work. But most people don't see it that way. They see me as the guy that says, well, no, you, you can't have three hours to like that. No, you can't do that. It's dangerous. No, you can't. So we're not... <laughs> We eat lunch alone, put a belly a lot. <laughs> ATs. Uh, look, if you yeah, ever go yeah, 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 yeah. and you see the one dude sitting there by himself, it's usually the first AD. Right, I get it. And uh, the other ADs are off busy dealing with the talent or dealing uh -huh. with tomorrow. So they're not there either. So anyway, so I came out here to do that. Little did I know also that throughout history of Hollywood, first ADs don't generally segue on to be directors. They work, mm. they have more producer skills because mm. or fixers. We have to anticipate and catch fires and put them out before they start. Right. And, uh, um, but there are only a few, like John Ford was the first AD. He's the one that did all those John Wayne movies. Sure, I know. Um, Ang Lee was the first AD. Mm -hmm. you know, but I couldn't tell you very many more in, in the annals of Hollywood that went on. Now, editors go on to direct because they know pace and timing and they know how to collect data efficiently when you're on the set and not have to shoot all this other crap to make the scene cut right in their head. And so they get, they direct, um, a lot, you know, stuff like that. You know what I mean? So AD is very much a, an industry goal where people are using it up. I also found out later that I think on the, the union roles, the average lifespan of a, of a DGA first AD, was considered to be like 57 years old because mm. of the stress. So I had to like reconcile that in my head and figure out a new way to do my job. Because a lot of the ADs that I did know were, we, we would call them the hammer. 
because they're seeing they just always be yelling at people and like, no, god damn it, and this and their gray hair and they're smoking and you think they're all coked up and my, and I was just like, mm, not going out like that. I'm not going out like that. I was lucky enough to be trained by a lot of those guys that were very good at their job, but they showed me the way <laughs> that not to go not, not to go down. And then I was also lucky enough to meet this young lady. Uh, her name was Julia Lennon. And I saw how she ran the set. And not only was it not like that, she was pleasant and people reacted to her and she could, you know, she had a smile and people enjoyed themselves and the set got run safely and fine. And I learned that from her, that uh, people react better to you a lot more when they want to work for you than when they're afraid of you. But don't you think, I mean, don't you think you the, guys, the guys that were first ADs, I mean, this is a, to give people a, an idea. I mean, these are, these, the crew, isn't there like a below the line and above the line? So the crew, even sort of how the crew developed in Hollywood, I'm sure it's, these are all, you like, these are like blue collar union guys, you know, right. that, that come up in a sort of a different kind of, I mean, they're not going to Morehouse and, and ma majoring in biology, right? I mean, well, they're salaried, below the line is salaried. Uh, I mean, below the line is like, we're, we have day rates, if you want to call it hourly. Above the line is generally, uh, you got a million dollars, but it doesn't matter right. if you work seven days a week, 23 hours a day, you're, you're, that's what you're, you know, you're, yeah. that's your salary. You know, the, the people that generally uh, run it are above the line. And it's not, that's not a lot of people. The director's above the line. The producers are above the line. Uh -huh. the line producer's above the line. Uh -huh. uh, I'm the assistant director. The director's above the line. I'm the first assistant director, and I'm below the line. Uh -huh. So I think I'm the start of the below the line. Right. Um, but those are two different cultures, don't you say? Would you say? Yeah, it, it, it's it's interesting too because as an AD, as a first AD, we have to do a job where we have to order around the people that can hire us and fire us. <laughs> and it's generally accepted. It's generally accepted that on the set, the first AD is the boss, even. I mean, the director's always the boss. Right. But the directors give the first AD the respect because they know that we're keeping them safe and on time and they don't have to think about that. It's, like, it's likened to everybody on the train, the hair department, the wardrobe department, makeup department, the drip and electric department, all have to do excellent work in that one department. And they don't have to worry about if lunch is on time or if the trucks show up or mm -hmm. if there's cranes flying above the actors' heads or whatever. So they know they can do their best work because somebody else is driving the train. Mm -hmm. I get and it. That's, that's the idea. And so we're given that respect on set. Now then behind the scenes, you may come back if it's done right and mm -hmm. on closed doors, shit gets fun. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. But that's part of the gig. And, yeah. uh, you know, I've never, I've done over 50 feature films. I can't tell you how many shorts music videos, webisodes, I've done way more, but I've done over 50 feature films in 12 years here in Los Angeles. And I've never been fired because of an argument with the director. I've been threatened to be fired twice for, for getting in it with producers, but- it hey, I'm, 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 I'm gonna interrupt you. What's interesting about you, right? Let me just, uh, I'm just gonna cut to this. I didn't say I was never fired. I said I was never no, fired. What's I'm interesting bad. about you is that you do, we're going to use the word DL. You do all of this sort of on the DL in a way. I mean, when you're like, well, yeah, I did, you know. I, I moved to L.A. at 39 and still have managed 50 films in, what, 12 years, you said? I got here November 28th of 2006. I started AD and sometime in 2007. So I got here just in time for the strike. <laughs> when most people were getting out. Name some of the films. I mean, people are interested in this. I am as well. What kind of films? I mean, who who did you end up meeting uh, while as you move through this uh, role as AD? I mean, do you have any interesting um, without without you know defaming I've a, anybody? I mean, I've met a lot of of, of talented people, uh -huh. both in front of and behind the camera. I mean. 
some of the, I'll tell you some of the ones I'm proudest of. I've, I've gotten to work in AD for Bill Duke, who was somebody that I looked up to. Sure, uh, sure, sure, sure. Actor, and then again as a director. Right. Um, I, I just worked recently, I've done multiple movies with Mario Van Peebles, who right. Mario enough. was a- active in uh, um, helping me get into the director's group. He, sure. I, I, I worked with him on multiple movies internationally, and he gave me an opportunity to step up as a producer on one of his last films. It's called Armed. And uh, I AD'd it as well, but he was also literally, I think the words he said to me is like, are you ready to step up your game? I said, yes. And so he, he was instrumental in helping me cross the threshold into the Directors Guild of America, yeah. which was one of my major goals. Mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a member of the Screen Actors Guild, the, the American Federation of Television and Recording Artists, sag after they merged into one union and now I'm a member of the Directors Guild. And um, Mario, <clears throat> I was teaching at the time as well. I was teaching at the New York Film Academy in, in, in Los Angeles. And as a part of the, um, one of the privileges we had at the school was that we were able to have a thing called Industry Lab. And if you could bring a movie to that, you have access to oh. all kinds of like camera equipment and lights and student interns and anything you can imagine. And I brought that to bear for the movie so Mario gave me help, allowed me to uh, have my one of my first producing credits on a, a feature film, mm-hmm. you know, and and I can't even quote you how many name people are in that for me because Mario wields you know a, a fair amount of power out here. Mm-hmm. Um, he, a lot of people don't know this, but other than being a super talented actor, Mario is a huge director. Like, mm-hmm. I, I bet you most TV shows you watch on network television, Mario's directed episodes. He was yeah. directing Empire. He was directing all kinds of stuff. But people don't know that side of him. And so every right, now right, and then right. he says, I'll do, I think he says, I'll do three for them and one for me or four for them and one for me or something like that. Meaning that he, he does his w- network worldly thing and then he does a project for himself. And that sure, was sure, hard. Sure, sure. Well, armed, and I'm very well, I figured he had to be up to something, though, Ed. I mean, because I think I, I I happen to see was he was he on a show? I can't remember if he was on a show recently. I don't know, or maybe I I think I also saw him on uh, your social media as well. And I mean, he's been out he's been out there for years, right? So it would make sense that oh, that yeah, yeah, he's oh, yeah he was. As a very young man, you know, he was already working like heart. I think he was working with. Uh, Clint Eastwood and, right. and his career goes back. I mean, my career right now, I think I'm in 40 years plus in mm-hmm. this business since my first job as, as an actor. Uh-huh. Mario's, I got to say, probably, you know, plus, plus maybe his dad, Melvin Van Peebles. Of you know, course, yeah. It's huge. And Mario came up working with his dad. So um, Let's see. I've worked with a, a lot of, I mean, go to my, my website. I've got a gallery. It has pictures. I've I got I the privilege of working with uh, Aiden Quinn, which was a great experience. I've worked with Andy Garcia, which was an amazing experience just to watch this gentleman work. And Did you create. have a picture with, uh, what's his name, uh, Julie Roberts' brother? No. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, what's his name? Eric Roberts. Eric. 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 <laughs> That was funny. Yeah, hey, look, was, Eric, if you see, Eric, if you're watching it, just just know that it, that's just a small gap. Because I mean, literally in preparation for this interview, I read his. Um, I happened to read uh, an article of his. I posted it on my social media, and he is interesting. He is because <laughs> he, he, let me just let me. I'm gonna throw this out to you. It's interesting what he's done. His wife, his current wife, is a casting director. Okay. And she basically started putting him in stuff, but she put him in almost everything. Like, Eric, every, Eric, are you kidding me, Eric's in everything? He's that's a what, working that, brother right that's, there. I think it was more like we got to keep this guy busy. I think she she had a strategy. It's like as long as he's acting, he's going to be a happy man. And he is happy. He's a he's a pleasure to work with. Right. He's, yeah. yeah. I've, I've 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 gotten to work with. Uh, Luke Goss, you know, and if you've watched Hellboys and the Death Races and, and, and stuff like that, he, I don't know. <laughs> I'm very talented. I've, I've gotten to work with him on multiple movies as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got some opportunities coming up with him, you know, on some projects going forward that are going to be dealing with hopefully international concerts and 
mm-hmm. and uh, all kinds of stuff. Well, if, if we can get if we can get in out out of this Corona, I'll tell you this. Let me let me tell you this. When I I cut my cable, there was a time where you know I was I was experiencing all of this um, growth and development, personal growth and development, and I cut off the cable. I cut the cable off. And so I, I wasn't watching TV as much, wasn't watching uh, film. It got to the point that the only time that I would watch film would be on the airplane. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I would make up for it then. And even on uh, recent years, I saw films that I probably would have heard about, but I only saw them on the plane. Like, so for example, there's this film with Bruce Willis, it was the H, was it uh, N, N, what's the guy who, uh, he, he directs Bruce Willis in a lot of these um, ghost, not ghost movies, M. Night uh, Shalom. Shyamalan? M. Night Shyamalan? So, exactly, thank you. Yeah. He, uh, he did this film. Sense, I think is what you're thinking. He did this film with uh, Samuel Jackson and, um, Bruce Willis, where he's on the train and he is in an accident and he doesn't die on the train. He's the only one that doesn't die. And what I started to see were were themes in each film that related to what I was going through in my own life, which is which is interesting to me. It's just interesting to me because I only saw films as pure entertainment. Um, you know, when we were younger, growing up. And then now, like, because I had not watched anything, I mean, I even watched a Spider-Man, like, cartoon, and got the message. <laughs> <You're talking about laughs> something. I mean, the littlest thing, I'm like, oh my God, they got messages in these, these movies. Well, it's required. <laughs> it's required. But it does seem like there's a method to the madness, meaning that there's someone there who is literally putting the message into the film. Like, I mean, it's, They've got everything covered. They've got the subtext. They've got the um, when you're when you're considering being a director. And how are you going to? You know, I'm not saying that you can't do this or what. I'm just curious: is how do you go about? You know, or how would you go about making these kinds of films that have messages? Um, it seems like a very difficult thing to do. Well, I mean. That's a good question. I mean, as a director, you could be working on somebody's film that you have nothing to do with and you're just hired to direct it, but that means you have to have an interpretation that translates and it's all approved ahead of time. Or you could be directing a piece of work that you've write, that's more popular now, especially on an independent level, to have writer directors because mm-hmm. you know, they, they, they wrote the whole thing. They're intimate about it. They know how they want it to come out. And if, if you've proven yourself on, with shorts and things like that, you know, there are opportunities to direct your own stuff, especially if you're involved in the, the financing of it. But I think the answer to your question is, um, the messages I think are sometimes, yeah, they're deliberate, but I mean, I think it comes from, you. The, the most popular things are come from writing what you know. Mm. I mean, you write from, a, I mean, you, people come up with fantastic ideas and things that are like you know, space aliens and stuff like that too. But usually if you look b- behind the themes and the threads of those stories too, they're usually about something very earthbound and very inside of us. And that's how it resonates to, that's how they get it to resonate with you. They write about something that it looks like it's a spaceship full of aliens, but it's really just a, another way of, putting a mirror up to something else and it's something else that hopefully will relate to the audience and therefore then it will resonate with them and you'll connect to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I wish I could give you a great example of, oh, I was watching this movie just this week and I don't get to watch a lot of films either. I get get all the movies sent to me as a part of the Directors Guild. I, I, I vote for the NAACP awards and the Guild sends you all the movies and SAG sends you all the stuff and I vote on all this stuff, but I, was, I, I don't have a lot of time to sit down and watch stuff as much as I'd like, but I did watch this one called Snowpiercer, mm. which I just happened to be flipping around on Netflix, which is new to me because I don't like paying for TV and stuff like that, but I got a 
deal with Netflix. So you, get, I'll get with Netflix. The time. you have to get with the times, Eddie. Well, it's not just that. It's like, it's, it's, I don't want it to distract and seep into my creative process. So I mm. try not to always be watching somebody else's stuff. You'd be surprised how many times you write something, you're like, oh, crap. That it was sounds so like somebody else's stuff. <laughs> now, <laughs> so, this movie, Snowpiercer, is about this, it's a future dystopian time where somebody invented the way to freeze everybody on the planet, and the only thing left alive are the people that are on this train. And, this, and it happens to be a time when the, the guy who invented the eternal engine on this train had a connected all the train systems on the planet into one giant circuit. Mm -hmm. So this train never stops. It's oh, just, I see. It's going and going and going around the planet. I think it takes, I don't know, 4,000 days. I can't remember what it was. Uh -huh. It was a uh, circuit around. But it, and, and on the back of the train are these slave-like, you know, soylent green eating, the poorest of the poor, you know, cannon fodder. And on the front of the tra a train, right behind the eternal engine where the the head guy lives by himself, maintaining the internal engine. You got the first class citizens who right. want for nothing, and you've got <laughs> the steak and the lobster. They, they have an aquarium. And, and then as you go back, there's more private, private. And you get all the way back in the train, and you have the, you know, slaves. And, and people have to be called because, as you know, people are, and it's generational. And so I'm like the, the underlying theme of this, and very beautifully shot, and very interesting. But basically, it's 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 talking about life, you know. Mm -hmm. It goes on; it doesn't stop. On the bottom is the poor people. On the top are the rich people. And there's the oligarch in the engine making all the decisions of who lives and dies. Sure. So, you know, that is, you know, I I, I think that it was talking to what you were asking me about the question about like the really good stuff that really resonates with people. The messages are built in because they're coming from something that you already know. Mm -hmm. And you just dress it up with other stuff to make it yeah. different, yeah. hopefully different, you know, or, or new and unique. There really aren't that many stories out there. Well, it seems, different. right, 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 right. But I mean, look, I, I had been uh, abstain, I had abstained from films, you know, for a while. And so I watched them with a, a, a bit more hunger right you know being on the plane and then you're there right like you're you're a captive artist there's um it's it, i think it's interesting times i mean ed i'm 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 excited to to see how things are going to work for you even during the, the pandemic i mean i think um if you've managed to do all of this in a very short period of time plus the fact that you were all you know several different cities before deciding to go to los angeles i mean I mean, how do you, I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty um, amazing accomplishment, wouldn't you say? Considering. Uh, I mean, you know, or, I mean, I, it's, it's just life to me. I mean, I've it's always, like, uh, yeah, no, you know, like, not, I don't know. I mean, I have to, you know, you have to be aware of your, your successes as much as your failures, because I mean, that's what keeps you going. That's mm -hmm. what keeps you be going but i mean it's for instance this covid situation is a lot like 2008 when we had the recession the crash mm -hmm. happened to be right at the time when i moved out here you know and a lot of people here in, in la where it's very expensive to live like it is in new york and san francisco had to leave people that had come out here to follow their dreams too as actors as at whatever whatever but the jobs are just gone and they just poof at one point, when I got out here, they were averaging, back in 2006, I think they were averaging about 36 studio movies a year. By 2008, I think it was down to like three. And now, if that, they might come here to shoot pickup shots to make it look like LA, sure. use the studios to shoot it for other cities. But this is Hollywood, Atlanta now, Vancouver, Toronto, all the right, TVs right. there. Porn even left here and went to right, Vegas. Too expensive. Too expensive. Uh, you know, I mean, so there's, you know, so people had to escape to go find work or they couldn't afford to stay here. Well, my timing, as usual, is impeccable. I got out here right in time for that. So when people were like starving or whatever, put into eating ramen noodles to stay afloat and everybody's paychecks cut in half because you have to do twice the work with half the staff for less money because you know, blah, 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 blah. It wasn't like, uh, for me, it's just like, 
as, as a freelancer or hustler or whatever, it's always been like that. So it wasn't that big a difference. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it's the same thing with COVID. I mean, this is bad because there's no work. I'm, I averaged five to six features a year, not to mention other projects. I've, I've done, I prepped for two weeks on one movie in January. And that from January 1st to January 19th. That's the only paycheck I've gotten since this mm -hmm. year. <laughs> and, but, you know, reining in your belt and, and, and adjusting to, you know, a God, I, mean, I tell you, it's God saying the bars are closed <laughs> because that's the only way people are right. saving money now is because they right. otherwise would be out drinking their money away. Right, no, 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 yeah. But, um, yeah, but I mean, having lived this uh, the freelance hustler world, see, I used to be in corporate America back, I mean, on a managerial level, not, not high up, but way, 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 way back in the day. And I fucking hate it. It's the same thing like when I told you what happened in D.C. when I had to punch a clock to make that dollar to save my marriage and all that kind of stuff. I just, some people ain't cut from that cloth and just deal with the bullshit and the politics and the, the there is, dig there a is hole. hole. No, there is a lot. Dig a hole. Why would I dig a hole? Well, because you're not off the clock yet. And then when I'm done, okay, you still got 15 minutes. Fill it back in. That's <laughs> another reason why I didn't, I, I briefly mentioned the Air Force. It's another reason why I didn't make it in that arena is because I don't do busy work. If it doesn't fucking make sense for me to expend my energies and talents towards something, why the fuck am I doing it? Why, because we're on the clock? So we just, I just had to figure out a way to invent my own clock. And yeah, it's, well, yeah, yeah. And it's tough, but you know what? It's somehow it, it manages to always remain fulfilling in the long run. And then when you get bumps in the road like now, Sucks, yes, but I mean, been there, done that. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. There's so much. There's so many other things that I could ask you, and, and perhaps, you know, after we we finish this, there will be more that will come. But I at least wanted to go back to sort of where we met and how we met in South Orange, Maple, because, um, yeah, I mean, we, I knew. I knew most of the people, black kids that I knew there were very, very talented people or are very, very talented people. And Ed was one of the people who I actually hung out with, watched him DJ. I think you're, you, you should, um, I don't see you, but you should be coming back shortly. Here you go. Um, I hung out right. watching DJ, would go over his house. You guys had, Awesome record. I mean, like, you really were doing it, doing the most. I mean, and then also, um, you were involved in special dance. You were involved in gymnastics. You were acting. You were uh, we acted in some sort of radio, like a radio, like a recording. It was a recorded com, com comic comedian sort of. Uh, exchange that we did with music. I mean, we did a lot of... <laughs> we got into some trouble with that, though. We lost some friends over that. <laughs> yeah. It was creative, though. It was very creative, right? Not so. <laughs> we, basically, we basically, we basically, there were these records a long time ago. You might, you may have remembered them. They would, there was one called like a water, it was like Watergate, right? So they would act like they were a news show and then when they would cut to a particular say, they would extract a part from a record, put it in, and that would be the punchline, right? So you would do a whole story around whatever it was we did, and then we we put different, you know, songs, different lyrics in the song. Now I think what what got us in trouble was that. Yeah, we didn't do a good job editing the lyrics in one particular case. Right. I mean, it was funny, though. Mine. It Chris was funny. Johnson, you misunderstood, sir. <laughs> you never gave me a funny. chance to explain that. It was, fun. it, it was funny. I know you got in trouble because it was, uh, we were making fun. It was a, it was a spoof or we made, made fun of people that we knew in, in, in high school. But I thought it was a, a very creative exercise. Not an average person could pull that off, right? And I remember... I remember setting it up because you, I forgot to tell you this. I was interested in marketing and promotion, right? So 
that is an art form, right? So, so part of the reason why I can go into business and even work in whatever role I, I always bring this element of promotion or marketing or sales to, to the, to the role. So, um, that's essentially what we were doing. That's essentially what we did. Right. And then we did such a great job that people were angry at <laughs> and not talking to you because there was a misunderstanding, but it was done, you know, not maliciously. I mean, as you remember, it was not a malicious. There, there was an incident where unfortunately, like there were, we had, we had a buddy that w really liked a certain girl. Right. We were poking fun at him. And so part of the song, we took Prince's song, I, I Want to Be Your Lover. And we used that as the song, like poking right, fun at him, blah, 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 blah. And then right, that song on. About it and then and the first it. part of the lyric, unfortunately, we didn't think, think of this, was uh, I ain't got no money. money. I yeah. want to be your lover. But all he heard was I ain't got no money part and thought I was like cracking on him for like being, having less than uh, me or you, us or something. And I was like, no, no, listen to the next lyric. I want to be your lover. But that's what we meant. Right, and, right. But, never, because never because the way, the way that it was set up is that as soon as you hear, I ain't got no money, everybody knows what that song is, right? Everybody knows so that the song. The line was, was for him was supposed to be, I want to be your lover, not right, the I have no money part. But I even went over, tried to explain it to him. He wasn't having it. He wasn't hearing it. And you was, haven't talked to him since? I think I talked to him once a few year, years back, I think since I've been in LA. And uh, all he had for me was, look, I got some family out there that I, I know you're connected, so hook them up. I didn't know what to do with that. Uh, <laughs> well, well, you're well, still well, me, but you want me to hook up? Whatever. But again, but again, you know, in other words, I knew you guys and anybody else from Columbia is watching this. We were, it was a very, very unique um, situation, uh, education. Um, and I'm thankful that I was able to, even though it was really, really um, a challenge when I first got there, I was thank I am very thankful that I met you and Carl and Lamont and Kathy. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. These people will, and even let's say this, and uh, before Facebook, I thought, well, I'll never see these people again. I've seen these people more times than I can shake a stick. <laughs> I can see them every day now. You know, so I, I think um, there's something to be said for it. I mean, um, any any last words you have with regard to what we've well, discussed? Because we we covered a lot. We covered, you know, how you came up and your time before getting to L.A. I mean, yeah, it was interesting coming up in, back then in those days and all that. And, you know, I've, I've never really gone back for, like, reunions or anything like that. But... Uh, you know, you see people on Facebook every now and then or whatever, check in. But, uh, you know, I'm not trying to say anything negative about anybody. It's just, you know, I, I have a hard time with the past. So I just keep it moving forward. And that's you all know. you can do. Uh, that's all I've had I mean, I will put it this way. Um, I would not have been able to do these interviews had I not had that experience in South Orange. Like in other words, you know, my time there was just like you, we were figuring out who we were. Yeah. We figured I out even who we were. I the DJ days thing. Like remember you mentioned the records. The, the, oh, the record, I did amazing records, everybody did. Had being, I got robbed for part of them with, from an ex-partner. All right, yeah, okay. And I collected for years and years and years and then I remember Hurricane Sandy there that hit Jersey in New York. Mm -hmm. Remember Hurricane Sandy? Yes. That beach house we were talking about had all my stuff there, but I was living in LA and I had my stuff stored there. That house got destroyed by Hurricane Sandy mm -hmm. and my house got looted. So all, like all that vinyl. Well, yeah, of course. All right. gone. Yeah. And I, I, my, the lady that I'm with now, um, we've been together for 10 years and she just, after a while, she's like, dude, I'm just tired of hearing you whine about these records. Why don't you just start The records were good. You got to tell her the records were amazing. 
I mean, and the records that they were putting out in the 80s, amazing. You got to admit, you got to admit. I it before because I collected like my sister who came before me and my mom's right. old records. I mean, you go back in history, it was just amazing stuff. And, uh, and now they're all playing it all again now, like discovering it like it's all new again. Anything 80s and 90s is valuable. Well, it's again. online. Here. It's on YouTube. Well, I mean, I do. I, have, I collect it again, and I actually went so far as to, uh, about a year or so ago. I went out and bought two techniques, twelve hundreds, and a mixer, <laughs> and I set up a DJ set up in my house. And then I realized quickly that, uh, and I and I went all over the country collecting it because I'm in the blues now. So, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, I collect everything, but uh, that's my focus. Um, oh, that's another thing that I haven't talked about that blues documentary. But anyway. Um, and then I quickly realized it, it wasn't the DJing that I missed. It was the vinyl. So yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I have a whole new collection now up there. And I, I sold the DJ setup, the techniques, which is interesting because those things still hold their value. Those 1200s, I, I got double what I paid for. Sure, 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 sure. Look, it's, a, it's all. And I, I wish I, I, I long for the, those are the days. And I bring it up also, like I look at it as, as a positive time where I developed creatively, right? And so, you know, in other words, being at your house, watching you guys, watching, you know, being at Columbia High School, interacting with those people, um, helped to hone. I mean, we're right across this, right across from New York, right? What, 40 minutes by car? If that. If that, yeah. if that, right? So we were in the hub. And I always tell people how I love listening to WBLS, and kiss like these are amazing those days are gone right? those days are gone so i reminisce about those but no any any last last words before we go we have to we'll, we'll have to do this again but we we will talk specifically uh, about some things well yeah i mean like in general. You, you said that it, i could you said that i could shamelessly plug my current agenda obviously right. you know, black is my website but that's under development right now. You can see some of the people I've worked with, but you know, next year it'll be even better. But one of the things that I just wanted to quickly, and I won't, I won't ramble, but I've been trying to start a national conversation surrounded okay. by this whole situation that's going on with the transformation of the police system and George Floyd. And, and I feel like something is going unsaid and I would really love to, uh, get the conversation started in the country and around the world, basically about what we can do as citizens if we're faced with a situation like those people were to have to watch somebody be murdered right in front of us. You know, I, I feel like we should not have to be able to stand by helplessly and watch while somebody is unlawfully beaten or murdered and not be able to intervene because of our fear for our lives. That we'll be shot or, or at bare minimum arrested and charged with a felony assault against the police. And a lot of people say, oh, this is impossible. It will never happen because they think that I'm trying to warrant the, the general public jumping on beating up police. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is actual legislation on the books that says that we could have a form of an enhanced citizen's arrest that if announced to while witnessing a, a murder, just because the murderer is wearing a police uniform should not exempt us from this. But if there's a group of us standing by and watching this happen, right in front of our very eyes, that if we announce our intentions as a group, that we, officer, if you do not stop what you're doing, we are going to intervene. Cameras are rolling, you know, videos so you can back up what's going on and lawfully take this man off this man's throat. And I think at that point, with the help of the police themselves, because they should be a part of this conversation on how to do this legally, I'm not talking about mobbing and swarming police officers or jumping on a police officer because you don't like the fact that they're arresting somebody. I'm talking about when it's very plain and clear. And go look at my Facebook page. I'm posting every one of them. You can see mm -hmm. them all where somebody is whipping someone's ass unlawfully or killing somebody. There's multiple killings like that. That as citizens, we should have the right to legally announce our intentions and the other officers that are involved in supporting this illegal act should be put on notice at that point that we are not going to support this murder right now, what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. That you, they should have to, you know, oh, uh, what is the one, one cop saying, uh, his lawyer saying, well, my, my 
uh, client has only been on the force for four days. So therefore, he was only doing what his training officer was saying. He shouldn't be held responsible for doing nothing because nobody else did anything. I see. I see. Okay. So in other words, then, if no, the lawyer says so nobody else did anything, so then you must agree with me then that we should be allowed to do something. Mm -hmm. We should legally be able to, and I'm talking about pushing for legislation, they call it a, a modified citizen's arrest. That, that, you know, and again, I'm not calling for the public to jump on and beat up cops. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about on the books to legally be able to intervene if we're witnessing an atrocity like that happened that day mm -hmm. and has happened since that day and happened many, many, many times before that day. And in order to get it to stop happening, you know, those, those officers acted with complete, like complete disregard for the fact that there were a dozen or more, I don't know how many people were standing there watching. Yeah. They couldn't do anything about it because who wants to be the first person to run up and get shot, right? I hear you. So I don't have the answer to that part, like who's going to be the first person to get shot. But I know that if, they, if it's put on the books that we legally have the right to de defend mm -hmm. I mean, there's even a law on the books now that says that you can't stand by and videotape and watch. Uh, it's called the Good Samaritan Law, I believe. I think they even did a joke about it on the last episode of Seinfeld. You, you're not supposed to just stand by. You should, you, maybe you don't have to run up and stop a mugging or, or physically. Right, you're supposed to just At least call right. the cops. Yeah. Or you call somebody and try and enter. So I think we should be citizens. Should, and I've already had a conversation with uh, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, um, let's see, a congressman here in California, uh, Jimmy Gomez, had a call the other day, an open call with um, the head of the uh, Congressional Black Caucus, Karen Bass, I believe is her name. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got on those calls and I pitched my ideas and I've had conversations online with the 100 Black Men type of organization, uh, the, American, uh, the African American Steering Committee at, at my union. Uh, and, this, and, and most of these conversations are not just black people. They're everybody sure. talking about that. Yes, we don't, well, oh, it's so hard. It's so tough. Like, I, I don't think that'll ever happen. Well, you know what? They said that about slavery. They said that about a black president. They said that about AIDS. Oh, that'll never happen. Well, you know what? Yes, it can happen. If we get the conversation going, especially now, mm. especially when all of this change and reform is being pushed right now, and if enough people are talking about it and want this legislation pushed and takes it to their congressman and, and, and include the police officers in the conversation on how to do this the right way, you know, again, not saying stopping police from making arrests. I'm talking about unlawful acts by the police. And that's a very different thing. So, I mean, I would love to hear from people. I've been posting it all over my Facebook every day, every day putting out the word, Instagram, every media, I'm screaming it from the rooftops. You gotta get this conversation started because I think it needs to happen. Well, I don't wanna stand there and watch somebody be murdered right in front of me. I, I think, I, th I think, um, well, uh, I'm glad I had you on and that you mentioned it because we talked about it before. Um, and I believe that this form is, or this, 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 interview series is going to be a place where those kinds of conversations are going to take place only because the last two interviews we touched on it as well mm -hmm. well I, I, I talked to a buddy of my not buddy a very good friend of mine um who was a law professor in, in one of the last uh interviews so i did three today and she laid out some really interesting points and we had a great discussion Right. So part of what this series is supposed to be about is identifying people like you, like her, and, you know, bringing these people together, either, you know, video or actually off camera. Right. Mm -hmm. So that things could happen. Because, you know, as I was telling you before, when I was working in news, I, was, I would watch what they were doing and who they were putting on. And I was like, why aren't any of my people why are we being called to be on TV? I know people that could kill these, you know, that know more than the people that they're selecting. So I, I was in the position so that I could. So, so you've created it, right? That's, that's yeah, I booked, I booked those people, you know, some of them. And so now I can book even more and we can have more conversations. That's my point.
and you know this is the beginning so at least the first video that you and i do at least people have to know who you are and you know well, who is this guy right so that that and and that's why it's a long form uh interview we we talked and, and hit on every single almost every single point that we talked about before all right yeah well and, yeah and, and you know what one of the things i'm doing professionally right now is i'm branding and and, and scoping out my company black eye vision to become more of a production company because right now content is king and, and, and everybody wants content and content can be anything and it, this is a good time to be developed yep. so if anybody has any ideas or wants to have access to i'm not a very deep rolodex and that's what we've been doing during covid when we've been on lockdown i've been working with a writing partner writing getting content ready for when floodgates open and they're, they're opening right now like Netflix, all kinds of people have put the word out that they're trying to make up for lost time, you know. Yeah, so we, well, yes, we work, we work, I've worked with Jameson Reeves, another very talented actor and writer friend of mine. Mm. Um, and we've developed, we've got five scripts on our, on our slate, five feature films, three of them are done, two of them are in development, two episodics, uh, a, 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 another two more series in, in the works, and with other writers as well. And so when people are starting ready for pitch, we haven't been sitting on our thumbs waiting to start. We're ready. Come out right. box so email me, Edward Beckford at black blackeyevision.com. And if you've got ideas, you know, I'm open to talking about it. And if you want to talk about what I mentioned about the national conversation uh, about legislation against police brutality, email me that too. I want to use everybody's information in my argument for it. And I've been getting a lot of feedback online, and a lot of it is stupid, like people that are Oh, well, first we got to kill the one percent, and then we get all the lawyers. And not, well, yeah, I guess that's to yourself. That's not constructive, and it's people not what talk. I'm talking about. People I, I want to talk to people that have legitimate questions and ideas that can mm. move forward, because I really do believe it can happen. Well, let's and I let's, thank you let's for this platform, and I thank you for the time. I'm, we got to catch up face to face soon one day. Uh, for real, I'd love to come to Switzerland, and I'm, you probably will get out to LA before that happens, but I'm not sure. But this is a really good thing you're doing, and I, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank yeah, you. No, no problem. And, and perhaps, let's say, as you move forward with you know, your project, specifically the one with uh, the police, uh, and you have more information or you get further with that, that would be another um, opportunity to, to catch up with you as well. because. Um, the names of the people that you contacted, these, these are people that eventually, I would love to interview. I would love to interview someone like mm -hmm. Hakeem Jeffries because another part that which, which we didn't talk about is that we don't really see people that are in our generation out in front. Now, yeah, he's there, but you don't see him visibly on the mainstream television talking about what he's up to. Right. You don't see him booked on Fox News. Right. You don't see him on C. You rarely see him on CNN. Right? No, um, but I think that's going to change. I really do. Um, the congressman out here, Jimmy Gomez and uh, Karen Bass, the head of the congressional back office, have drafted a bill about they have a three point plan that got presented to Congress uh, this week, and it, they, 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 they shot it down themselves because it got watered down in the process and they're redrafting it. It's a three point plan. And w one of the points, which is creating a national registry for police that continually get to be written up for violent acts and then just get quit or fired and then they move on to another jurisdiction. To another department. And, job. And, and that's something that I think is huge. There's two mm -hmm. more main points about it, but I'm not gonna drone on about it. Look it up. I think it's called the um, George Floyd uh, police and injustice. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but just look up. We'll, uh, we'll put we'll box. put it in the information box or the the, the description box. Anything that you want to to highlight? What what I'll do is I'll put that in the uh, put that in the box. And if you you know in terms of your contact information and that sort of stuff. Oh, uh, Justice Policing Act. Mm -hmm. Justice in Policing Act. Mm -hmm. uh, just yeah, and it's uh, so I got on the phone immediately and said, "Okay, I want this to be point four. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen, but I think if enough of us talk about it and and believe in it and push it, you know, I'll I'll lead the way on it. But uh, I need people at the back there that, that are passionate about it. You got to keep. I love that the protests are continuing. I love that the conversations are continuing because 
everything just in the past just sort of fizzles out and the next news cycle it changes and they try to like distract us with other things. This one ain't going away. This is not going to go away. Mm -hmm. I feel, I really do feel optimistic and hopeful that some real change can happen. And you know why? Because it's all of us. It's not age. It's not race. It's, it's not even nationality. Everybody around this planet is talking about this. Yes, sir. It's passionate about this. Yeah. So it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And it's, it's, it's an incredibly large space now in which to swim, right? Whereas before these conversations were not. Um, and I'll tell you, for example, the person who is the leader of my uh, the place I work, his minority American, and he mentioned it on a conference, a corporate conference call, not once, but twice in two different conference calls. Which I was like, it was like, it's generally that never happens, right? But he is uh, a minority. Like he's not, he's he's not white. He's you know he's he's a, a East Asian. Um, but I mean, the fact that it's mentioned, and you should also understand what I'll, I'll say this: um, it was mentioned, but because we're in Europe, there was a bit of distance with regard to the issue, right? It, 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 it's, it's, it's almost like what the same way when 9-11 happened and the rest of the country was like, well, you know, like why, why y'all, why you guys are so upset? You know, that was sort of, there, there was a bit of that, but, um, and it's interesting. We, 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 I'm going to end. Let's, uh, let's. Uh, right, I'm time to go to sleep. Yeah. You know, you are <laughs> old man. <laughs> hey look it is what it is i put my uh, email down in the name box for anybody that wants to hit me for uh i see what you're doing okay and, we'll, and we'll also on. make sure that once we you know start to populate it yours will go on this will go on tomorrow on bit shoot and it will go on uh youtube on monday right Can you send me links so I can, uh, yeah, so yeah. I mean, everything will be on social media. It's not an issue. Like, and then uh, whatever you want. Like, we'll we'll make sure that you get the information so that you can share the videos. Um, Perfect. That was my next question. Can I push it out there? On yeah, absolutely, platform? absolutely. That's the whole idea. Because now, as you know, is people can pick and choose what they want to watch versus having to go to a movie house. So they can go to Netflix. So, you know, this COVID has actually helped me to do what I know how to do, right? Which is yeah. promote, mm -hmm. produce, <laughs> and, and be creative, right? So, but well, that, yeah. that I'll let you go. You know, you get out this way, bro. I'm gonna meet you, Carl. I'm gonna take you guys out on the boat. We're gonna go sailing, dude. That's, that's, that's my piece in, right now. Is well, well, we gotta make sure that we gotta get beyond COVID. I mean, it seems like things are closing back down again, but we'll have to watch it. Uh, well, we knew the shit was gonna to, and like everything else, it's got to get broke before it gets fixed. Because fools are fools, and there's just a whole lot of us. <laughs> Ed, thank you very much. All right, my friend. Enjoy the rest you. of your evening, and uh, I will talk to you very soon, like tomorrow. Right. So, <laughs> I got you. Thanks, man. Peace. All right, cheers.